Uh, okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I welcome all of you on behalf of Apna Merit, which is an uh, acronym and abbreviation for Medical Education Research and Development. We have been doing these webinars for the last uh, over a year. And so far, we have the largest repository of uh, healthcare related information in addition to the uh, clinical side. There are a lot of other valuable archive material. If somebody would like to know more about the Pakistani uh, healthcare value chain and you know the healthcare delivery, we had many sessions about the clinical trials. We have many sessions about the innovation and many more things. Um, and you know to highlight the importance of uh, medical devices so they have a key and a pivotal role in the delivery of healthcare whether it's a uh, detection of disease uh, management of disease prevention of disease and you know to make the life easier for the patient so we are trying very hard to map the total uh, value chain in healthcare in Pakistan, you will find a lot of material. I'm going to share with you the YouTube channel of Apna Merit where you can find all the material. If anyone is interested from the academic reason or for any other reason, you can have a look to all of this material. Uh, to Just to highlight, we don't know exactly the uh, market size of uh, medical devices in Pakistan. But from the US, you know, uh, the, the medical devices, they form like five to 6% of the national health expenditure. And we assume that invariably there is a substantial similar proportion back in Pakistan. And uh, these are very essential. The global market size uh, from the different perspective is close to 600 billion US dollar depending on whether you include or exclude the in vitro diagnostics into the medical devices or it's a separate component. So just to share with you the uh, impact of the medical devices, we are all familiar and we know about the burden of diabetes mellitus in Pakistan. And we know just the blood sugar monitoring very small devices. So the average consumption pattern is between uh, three to four billion Pakistani rupees. So this is just a small component to highlight, you know, the magnitude and the importance of medical devices. Uh, but, you know, we have the expert, we have the people. Um, first of all, we had an, um, the apology from the chief executive officer of Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan. He had a medical emergency in the family and he had to rush. So he apologized. Uh, but we have the uh, main speaker, Mr. Eric Fletcher, and we have the uh, subject specialist, Dr. Rom Noman um, from Pakistan. So I'm going to introduce both the professional. Uh, Mr. Eric is having a very, very uh, long history spreading over close to 30 years into the infusion system, into the medical devices, into the innovation. And uh, he used to develop the solution both for the private market and including the Department of Defense in the United States. And he joined this commercial organization, Bionic, back in 2008. And I was just uh, discussing with him that he has uh, left everything and there in the load shedding and these scorching heat back in May, June, which is really becoming a challenge. And now he has taken the responsibility to develop this innovative solution and peritoneal dialysis and trying to figure out the uh, regulatory activity for this thing. Um, we also have with us Dr. Norman, uh, a great professional and academician, a fellow Kamkolian back in um, 88. And uh, 
He was trained in nephrology at University of Illinois, Chicago. He was the, um, you know, remained in the forefront of nephrology. He's a secretary faculty of ne ne nephrology college of physician and surgeon Pakistan. And uh, also a scientist, editor and publisher of Pakistan Journal of Kidney. He has in his credit about 35 publication and he has written and contributed to three book chapter in nephrology. So I welcome both the, uh, the our panelists and our key speaker. And I welcome all of you. Assalamu alaikum, good morning, good afternoon. Whichever part of the world are you going to join? About myself, I'm Dr. Uzair and my core interests are, uh, I'm a healthcare management consultant and faculty to business studies. So I'm working with uh, this Apna Merit Group for over about uh, two years now. I'm from Toronto, Canada. So with this, I request uh, Mr. Eric to start his formal presentation. Please, Mr. Eric, join. Well, good morning or good evening, everybody. Um, Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> As you can see, I'm sitting here in the dark in Pakistan. Uh, lost power just moments before I logged in, which, um, but we have technology. So I have a wireless internet device and we're ready to present. So my name is Eric Flashbart, I'm Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Bionics. Um, I've been developing products like this for the last 30 years. Um, I became involved with Bionics in 2017 and moved here to Lahore in um, January of this year. So I'm going to be here for an extended period of time, uh, enjoying the, the food and uh, as well as the, the challenges of uh, load chip. So uh, <clears throat> We'll begin. The, the presentation is about the risks of medical devices, how that affects development of these devices and the regulatory clearance process, whether that be through the FDA or CE mark or, or draft. It's a <clears throat> very similar process. So to begin, and of course it's not working. So we have some object objectives tonight. Um, one, of, one of the things is we're gonna learn what a medical device is, how does it get approved, what is risk, how do we evaluate risk, how does that affect the regulatory approval, and um, probably more importantly, how do we use, how these devices are used in actual use in hospitals or in patient homes um, to ensure the safety of the product. So we'll begin with the FDA definition of a medical device. <clears throat> Basically, it's a device, not a drug, uh, which diagnoses, cures, mitigates, or treats, or prevents disease in a, in a, in a human. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't serve the same purpose of a drug. Um, <clears throat> and it's not uh, an app or data storage. It's, it's something which actively uh, contributes to treating a patient. Um, that, in a, a nutshell, is uh, basically what FDA considers to be a medical device. <clears throat> so there's multiple approval pathways for medical devices. Um, the first thing is going through what we just talked about. Is it a device? Uh, and if it is a device, then it <clears throat> is uh, uh, acceptable to use the FDA pathway for clearance. Um, there is an exemption for humanitarian use if uh, it's a very small population of uh, patients, um, and that goes through a different pathway, but 99% uh, of medical devices will go through this full pathway. So the first thing that's determined is, is the risk of the device, which is what we're talking about tonight. And if it's low risk, you go in class one. and <clears throat> Some of those actually don't even require uh, clearance. 
Um, they're exempt from the FDA 510K uh, regulation. Um, moderate risk devices in what's known as class two. And this is typically uh, cleared through an FDA up. Typically does not include or require clinical trials because in a 510K, what we're doing is we're not determining the safety or efficacy of the device. <clears throat> we're comparing it against devices which are already on the market. And basically what that means is these devices are well known uh, in terms of their risk. They're well known in terms of their use. And <clears throat> what we're really doing is, is a streamlined pathway is, is to say that you know our new device is just as safe and effective as, as device in use, so they need to compare. High risk devices go into class three. Uh, this typically does include clinical trials. Uh, it's a much longer process. Uh, 510K statutorily is 90 days. Typically they take between six months and a year. Uh, PMA can go multiple years and a big portion of that time is doing clinical trials. Another way a device could wind up in class three if it's brand new, <clears throat> there's no experience with it. Um, so it's unknown, there's nothing to compare it against which is already in use. Uh, and again, that would do, require clinical trials. Um, <clears throat> sometimes that gets shuffled back down to a 510K if it's a relatively low risk device, but it's, it's, it's a much more involved process. So <clears throat> risk, we live with risk every day. Um, I just started driving here in Lahore and I almost got hit a couple of times today. So I had my fill of risk. But risk is a drug or any medical device. Devices can fail. <clears throat> Sometimes they're used in ways which we as developers didn't uh, anticipate. Um, that's sort of analogous to off-label drug use. Sometimes we make mistakes. There can be errors in the design. There can be errors in the software, bugs. We try to mitigate and mitigate risk as much as we can. Um, and that's done through risk analysis, which we will go through here in, in a little bit. <clears throat> and it, because again, everything has risk, risk of adverse events are weighed against the benefits of the device, uh, the benefits of the use of the device. So, it's, a, it's always an analysis, it's a decision point. Um, is, is this risk, risk likely to hurt somebody? How frequently is it going to happen? And is that offset by the benefits of using? <clears throat> so again, for FDA, we classify, they classify them into three different classes. Um, Class one, which is a low risk device, class two, which is a medium, and class three, which is a high risk device. So a good example of a class one would be a hospital bed. It's pretty hard to hurt somebody with. <clears throat> would be what I'm working um, along with the, the team at Bionics, a peritoneal dialysis machine. Um, <clears throat> pretty difficult to hurt somebody with that. Uh, class three would be like an implantable pacemaker, maybe an implantable infusion pump, where if it's delivering life-sustaining medications and it fails, somebody could, could die uh, very quickly. So uh, those are the three classes of devices. And um, each of those goes through uh, a different uh, stringency path. <clears throat> Today contain software. So, this is a further level. Um, <clears throat> if it's a low risk device, uh, it would fall into the minor concern category. If it's a moderate device, it would uh, moderately risk device, it would fall into the moderate, and major would fall into um, you like it a drug infusion pump, where even though it's class two, um, there are ways which uh, a software error could. Um, really uh, cause harm to a patient. Um, and basically all of these three things do, it just determines the level of risk analysis and documentation uh, that we go through 
And then we provide to the regulatory body, again, being DRAP or FDA or CE. Um, so for a minor concern device, there'd be relatively straightforward uh, analysis and documentation. And for a major, uh, there would be uh, very stringent uh, requirements for that. And these follow IEC 62304, which is the standard for software and medical devices uh, in Europe, which has been adopted by the FDA. It's used pretty much worldwide. And what happened there? <clears throat> so this is the risk management process. Basically, we identify risks <clears throat> and risks are probably more frequently identified through uh, reviewing uh, similar devices which are on the market and how have they failed and how has that impacted the patient. We go through an analysis of those risks, which includes you know, how severe are they? Um, how often do they happen? Uh, so we evaluate those. We go through a risk control phase where we try to ideally uh, modify the design to mitigate those risks. Then we go through a period of risk ex acceptance, <clears throat> where at this point we've mitigated things as low as we possibly can. And we determine whether this is acceptable to proceed or not. And this goes back to that risk benefit analysis. <clears throat> the outputs of that fall into the management process. Um, and this follows the device post into actual This risk analysis is not just done during development, but it follows the life of the device. <clears throat> so how do we evaluate risk? Well, we use a, an ISO standard, it's 14971, and it basically describes how we uh, identify, um, assess, and mitigate risks. And this is a standard which is accepted by the FDA. It's used worldwide. And again, risks are typically identified using field experience of, of similar devices. And it's also done through literature search. And as we'll discover a little bit later, it's done through a review of the design and how the design could fail or how the design could be used in ways that uh, we are not anticipating and try to identify as many of the risks as we can and um, include mitigations for each of those as much as, much as possible. So risks are assessed by estimating a frequency of occurrence. There are some software, uh, software errors which probably would never happen, but we still have to account for them. There are other risks which could happen frequently. <clears throat> we also uh, estimate what the severity of that would be. And a low severity might be <clears throat> um, an annoyance, um, doesn't require medical intervention. And a severe risk would be uh, a risk of real harm, lasting harm, death or serious injury to a patient. And we perform risk analysis through a couple of different methods. One of them is bottom up, where we're looking at each part of the, the device and, and how the function it serves, how it could fail um, and what would happen. And that's called failure mode effects analysis. We also use a top down method where we <clears throat> take all of those risks that we've or harms that we've uh, identified and then go back into the design to see how they could happen, logically how they could happen. So a combination of this bottom up and top down is designed to be uh, 
rigorous in, in examining the device and the use of the device in terms of um, identifying all of the risks. <clears throat> so this is an example of a severity chart. <clears throat> in ranking one negligible, it doesn't affect the product performance. It's basically an annoyance. At the other end of the scale, we have five, which is severe. And this would be a failure which can happen at any time uh, with significant patient harm or side effects uh, possible. And so that is that is uh, the worst thing that, that could happen in, in the failure of the device or in a use which we didn't anticipate. Notice I'm not saying that the user did something wrong because it's not the user that does something wrong. It's us as the developers who didn't anticipate it. <clears throat> also, there's probability of occur, uh, occurrence. Uh, the low level is, is something that's probably never going to happen. And usually those are software failures. Um, all the way up to frequent, <clears throat> which we know is going to happen. Um, you know, that could be a fuse blowing or it, it could be uh, basically anything that, that's likely to happen in use and will happen continually. And the way we evaluate these is, is gonna be shown on the next slide. <clears throat> so we multiply the severity by the probability of occurrence, we get a, a, a risk number. <clears throat> So you see green, red, and sorry, my computer is misbehaving. See green, red, and yellow. <clears throat> green means we're okay at, as it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a minimal risk. It's not gonna happen all that often, or if it is gonna happen all that frequently, nothing bad is going to happen. The other end of the scale is red. That's unacceptable. We have to do something about that. And in between is yellow. <clears throat> that is where we try to mitigate as low as possible. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we can't get it into the green. We, we, we can't eliminate it. <clears throat> so that's where that risk benefit analysis comes in. And of course, Zoom is going to prevent me from going on the next slide. If you can somebody, here, could somebody, <clears throat> my, yeah, my computer here is, is misbehaving. Could somebody share and I'll continue the let me, there? Let me check. Kirmani, can you open up the presentation, please? Yes, sir. Please open it and start running the presentation. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing here. Yeah, he's going to do it. You stop it. So we want to get to that risk matrix there. Yeah. Go on. Yeah, disagree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks. <clears throat> um, so uh, I apologize for that. Um, computers are wonderful. Um, so we have green, which is uh, we've done. It, it's a low low uh, frequency of, of occurrence and a relatively benign harm. Uh, we have red, which we have to do something about. And we have yellow, which we've done everything that we can, but um, <clears throat> it becomes a risk benefit at that point in time. Could you move to the next slide? <clears throat> so because this is dry stuff, I thought I would, uh, share a little of experience uh, of my time here in Pakistan. So I'm an American, I'm living in Lahore, Lahore. My company is always worried about my safety. So they hired an armed guard to sit outside my house. 
And I can tell you, I live in Tampa, Florida. We don't have armed guards, especially with AKs. I've never felt unsafe here. I drive around a little two-seater convertible sports car and everybody is extremely nice to me. I, I love it here in Pakistan. Until <clears throat> one Saturday morning, at the beginning of Ramadan, I had my guard was out front. I knew he was going to sit out there all day long without food or water. So I got up at three o'clock in the morning. I made him food. I brought him water. I went out the front door to give it to him. He was sleeping on his cot, jumped up and aimed his rifle at me. <clears throat> and at that point in time, I think I decided that I was I was safer without the guard and I'd accept the risk. Uh, can you move on to the next slide? <clears throat> So we're going to talk about failure modes, effects analysis. This is, again, this is that bottom up. So uh, it can be conducted. You can do this on every single little component in the device. Uh, it winds up being an enormous analysis. 90% of it is uh, meaningless. Uh, or it can be done at the subsystem level, which is typically where people do it. Um, so we look at all the constituent parts of the device, how they might fail. The power supply has a power supply fail. Well, it doesn't produce voltage or maybe it produces too much voltage. Um, so for each of those failure modes, how something could fail, we then look at the system and say, well, what would the system do? Um, does this present any harm to the patient? Would we know about it? Um, can we do anything about it? Is, is there redundancy? Um, so this is, this is a very, very good an analysis. It's a very powerful tool. Can we move on from the next slide, please? So this is an example of one. <clears throat> so it's a tabular format. Um, in, in this example, we have a bubble sensor. And what does that do? Well, it's in the patient line and it looks us if there's bubbles in the fluid, which is gonna be going to the patient. How could it fail? Well. It, could fail two ways. No bubbles are detected, or maybe it sees bubbles all the time. But what's the hazard? <clears throat> well, there's bubbles in the line, that's air in the line to the patient. It's not good. If it sees bubbles all the time, that means we, we can't operate the system. The patient doesn't get the therapy. The harm to the patient in, in the instance where there's air in the line well, it could result in an air embolism. <clears throat> if it's always seeing a bubble and we can't use the device. Well, that's a loss of the therapy. Next column would be, well, what are we doing about this? Well, we have a redundant sensor in this, in this case. Um, so for, we've assigned the severity, the probability of occurrence. And the, these are just examples. Um, severity here for, it's not detecting bubbles as a five. The probability of occurrence is a two that gives us an RPN of the 10, that's a red. So now we have to do something about that. So even Unmute Eric. You are muted, please unmute yourself. Yeah, that's fine, yes. <clears throat> so I'm back. Um, so that first case falls into a red. So we would still have to do something, even though we have a, uh, a redundant sensor, maybe we have to add tests at power up to make sure that they're working. And in where it's continually detected, well, that's green, we're, we're not gonna hurt it. We move on to the next slide. So fault tree analysis is top down. So we assume hazards. Um, then we look at those hazards and say, well, how could these possibly happen in our device? And what's the connection between those? And we develop a tree. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. So this is an example. <clears throat> um, our top hazard uh, is delayed therapy. Well, how could that happen? Well, we have an OR gate there, so we could have missed alarms, we could have a pressure sensor failure, we could have a Hall effect sensor failure in this particular hypothetical device. 
We go further down, but what can cause a missed alarm? Well, we have an alarm condition that happens and we have a buzzer failure. So our audio alarm is not working. If both of those happen, we're gonna have a missed alarm and that could wind up being in, in delayed therapy. So, so as you can see, this starts from the top um, and works its way down, whereas the FMA, FMEA starts at the bottom and works its way up. And hopefully between both of those paths, we've, we've caught everything. Next slide, please. So it's not only failures in the device which pose risks, it also can be how the uh, device is used, whether it's an infusion pump for an APD, uh, APD machine or a CAT scan machine. Um, sometimes uh, we, we try to, as developers, we try to do a good job of um, assessing how people are gonna use this in real life, but sometimes we're surprised. Um, so we mitigate these just as though we mitigate um, failures in the device. And we try to identify these as many as possible. Uh, these follow a slightly different path. If we can do something in the design that prevents it, uh, we will do that. That's the best case. If there's nothing that we can do in the design, we have to add warnings and cautions in the user manual. So that's, that's handled within um, the labeling. And I'll, I'll tell you a little story. We, we started doing uh, human factors trials. I started doing them when FDA required them for infusion pumps about 10 years ago. And I had a product which I was working on from a, with a customer and it had a button on the keypad with a back arrow. And so we had an anesthesiologist that would enter all the data and hit the back arrow. So we'd go back one screen. He'd enter all the data again, he'd hit the back arrow. He'd go back one screen. <clears throat> he didn't understand, he wasn't supposed to be hitting the back arrow, he was supposed to be hitting next. And when I asked him, what is wrong with this? Well, it looks just like the enter key on my keyboard. And he was right. And that, that was a really good example of, um, a design change that we could make to make the device much more usable. Next slide, please. So what we just discussed was human factors simulations. Um, we, we use these as a method of risk analysis. Uh, we, it's sort of like a clinical trial where actual users, or clinicians, or if the device is a home use device, are tasked to actually simulate use of it, uh, but it's simulate. It's, it's not on actual human patients. So it, it's not in operation, it, it's all simulated. And um, <clears throat> I was, after that anesthesiologist, uh, after that discussion, at the beginning of this, I, I said, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, I know what I'm doing. And after he showed me that, that was so powerful and the company that I owned, I put in an entire simulated hospital OR room is I don't think Band-Aid should be sold without actual simulated use. It's such a powerful thing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when we identify hazards, they have to be addressed in the design, accounted for in the requirements if it's possible. And then, uh, in, um, assessed through verification and validation. And those are both two means of how we test devices. Verification is focused on what the device does. <clears throat> and validation is, focuses on how the device operates with real users based on its intended use. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so how does this all affect the FDA? in the FDA's re review. <clears throat> we learned that risk is one of the factors that term determines the class. Um, FDA standard is the device is safe and effective to use. And that's pretty much true for all the regulatory bodies. Um, <clears throat> and this is why those really high risk devices are placed in class three. They need the most scrutiny uh, before they're released to the market. 
Class two devices take a, a different path. They still have to be safe and effective, but instead of demonstrating that through actual human trials, um, we prove them through analysis, test, and documentation that they're equivalent to products which are already on the market and have proven to be safe and effective. Next slide, please. So in FDA's review, risk also affects the review process. Higher risk devices get much more scrutiny. Uh, the class three is a pretty well established risk benefit analysis which is performed and FDA uses that to determine you know is this device when it's on the market is, is it going to be it's going to be beneficial to patients or are the risks involved uh, do they outweigh the benefits <clears throat> for class two devices again what we're really doing is comparing these in terms of safety and efficacy to pro products which are already in use and that's done through uh, FDA's review of our risk analysis, how we comply with standards, um, and the results of our testing, that independent verification and validation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and again, we talked about this earlier, um, class two devices uh, with software with a major concern all of the risk, all the design documentation, all the verification val validation are submitted and reviewed uh, by the FDA. And <clears throat> because these 510Ks get pretty voluminous, uh, one of them I wrote a couple of years ago is about 10,000 pages. So you wanna think about your tax money, think about how much it costs to write and review 10,000 pages of documents, but it's necessary. But typically this is done through a trace matrix. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is a very simplified one, but basically what this does is we want to map through what did the user need? What does the device have to do? Next layer down is the design input requirement. This, this breaks those user needs down. It's what, what does the device have to do? Um, <clears throat> detailed requirement is, well, the software has to do, it has to check the bubble sensor. The electronics has to, uh, support the bubble sensor. The mechanics has to uh, provide support to the bubble sensor. Th those are detailed requirements. We include the associated risk to that and the verification and validation. So for each of these requirements, we've performed a test to ensure that the device actually uh, meets those requirements. Um, and this is a relatively uh, straightforward way for someone to go through and ensure that everything that we said we were going to do, we did, and we've demonstrated it through tests without going through 10,000 pages of documents. Next slide, please. So I said, as I said earlier, um, risk analysis doesn't end when clearance happens and it's placed on the market. Um, we also monitor risks once they're in actual use in, in, in hospitals and in homes. Um, <clears throat> so we're doing this continually. This is done both by the regulatory bodies, such as the FDA and the manufacturer. We're tracking frequency of occurrence of these. We're tracking severity. And uh, as we're going to see in the next slide, as manufacturers and as uh, users, uh, this mandatory reporting, uh, MDRs for the FDA, and MDVs for Europe. Next slide, please. So we as manufacturers are required by law to log and trend these complaints. So uh, when we become aware that one of our devices has failed, which uh, if it were to happen again, could hurt somebody, we're required to log that, um, review the design, see if there are mitigations, further mitigations that we can add. Um, these are also logged by the FDA. <clears throat> uh, typically these come through as complaints, which is a uh, an expression of uh, 
dissatisfaction that alleges deficiencies in some way. Um, when those complaints can uh, result in harm, uh, we as manufacturers are obligated to tell FDA about that. That's through a MDR, a medical device report, or in Europe, an MDV. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. And so both manufacturers and user facilities are mandatory reporters for this. So if we have a device in final test, it hasn't been shipped yet, and we see that it's malfunctioned in some way that could hurt somebody, we are required to submit uh, an MDR on that. If we get a complaint from a, uh, a user, <clears throat> um, say a peritoneal uh, machine uh, infused too much fluid into the patient's peritoneum, uh, we're obligated to uh, report that. And user facilities are as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so we just talked about this. U user facilities must, must re report as well. Okay, next slide. Um, Next slide, I just talked about this. So FDA monitors and trends these. Um, it's very interesting reading. You, you can access these on this link. Um, you can search by manufacturer, you can search by type of device. And we use this in the beginning of the risk analysis process. So we will go through, uh, FDA has years and years of experience uh, log on this database. And we can see how each device, how it has actually failed in the field um, <clears throat> and use that in our risk analysis to improve our design. So hopefully uh, we, we've eliminated or mitigated that risk. Um, FDA trends these. Um, and if they see a trend which uh, they're concerned about, that can trigger an audit. And you know, that's happened to me personally. Uh, FDA shows up, uh, <clears throat> wants to know, uh, why we're having such and such a failure, uh, why, is, why that's been increasing. Um, so it's a very effective tool to ensure that uh, the devices, after they've been sold and after they bring the real use, are, are performing right. Next slide, please. So when, when we identify these, these feed back into the risk analysis. So risk analysis never ends. Um, we've updated those documentation. We've looked at mitigations again. Uh, maybe we're changing the design uh, to further mitigate it. Maybe we're adding additional warnings and caution or, or additional training uh, so that users can uh, avoid these. Next slide, please. So these are, some words of my experience here in Pakistan, I've, I've been doing this for 30 years and now I'm living in Lahore, um, hoping to, to help folks here uh, develop the experience to produce these devices here locally. Um, Pakistan's unique, it has a highly educated and dedicated workforce. I'm extremely impressed with the people that I've worked with here. But, you know, this is a complex process. And if you're starting from scratch, it's, it's really hard to know where to go. So um, that's why I'm here. Uh, I'm here to lend some experience and uh, enjoy some Pakistani food. And, uh, you know, my, my hope is that more developing countries will, will take on this challenge. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's good for everybody. It's good for you know, the healthcare system and it's good for the economics of uh, individual uh, countries. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so these are my last, last words. And this is a personal experience. This happened to me as a father. My daughter, <laughs> I adopted her for uh, 22 months from China. She had a bilateral cleft lip and palate. Wound up having seven surgeries here in the US. And uh, I was living in Vermont, that's uh, the company I, I was running uh, was, and we produced drug infusion pumps. 
So after one of her surgeries, I went in, in, into PACU to see her. And lo and behold, there's one of my devices manufactured in my factory in Vermont, delivering morphine, which this product wasn't indicated for. This was, this was for antibiotics. And that really brought this home. I mean, I was, um, I, like I wrote here, I was simultaneously horrified and proud. <laughs> so next slide, please. Next slide, please. So that, that in a nutshell is risk analysis and medical devices. And uh, I hope the, that you found it interesting. I enjoyed giving the talk. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. It was indeed a pleasure to attend your thoughts about the regulatory maze by the FDA. And we are so happy and uh, to announce that the Chairman Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan, uh, Mr. Asam Rauf, he had also attended uh, part of the session. So I think th that's very heartening and that shows the dedication from the Drug Regulatory Authority to promote the medical devices and uh, this culture in Pakistan. So now I will request uh, Dr. Noman to share his experience with the medical devices in his own specialty as a case and what are the limitations, what are the challenges, what are the advantages and you know, to correlate it, whatever the Eric was sharing from the FDA perspective. So uh, Dr. Noman, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Uh... Assalamu alaikum and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it was a great talk, Eric. And um, although I thought uh, making a device is, it takes a lot of uh, effort in terms of manufacturing and uh, innovation and thought process, but I think equal amount of uh, time and energy is spent in terms of getting it approved. And uh, it is very vital mm -hmm. and important for our patients since uh, these devices can save lives and at the same time can be detrimental for the health. Um, uh, being a nephrologist, uh, we are used to many of the devices and uh, the two major devices that we uh, work with is the hemodialysis machine and the peritoneal dialysis cycler. Uh, the hemodialysis machine is freely available in Pakistan and a lot of patients are getting dialysis. And uh, one has to understand in Pakistan, uh, we have a population of patients on dialysis, which is much younger than the rest of the world. So uh, we have patients who are on average about 40, 45 years old. And whereas in USA and, uh, and the Europe, uh, the patients may be around like 60, 65 years of age. So there's a huge difference. And so this is a major uh, workforce or uh, useful members of the society if we do not provide uh, adequate uh, dialysis and uh, management, uh, they are going to end up just being kind of, you know, uh, does not look like a good word, but kind of a parasite on the, uh, for uh, the whole society where the whole families are just trying to uh, uh, just uh, make the ends meet and at the same time uh, trying to support their loved ones uh, from this devastating disease. So uh, just looking through my, uh, from the Pakistan Journal of Kidney Diseases, we had a number of publications just on the epidemiology and, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the problems that are faced by these patients. So as I said, you know, they are younger patients uh, almost, you know, like uh, 70, 80 percent of them may be malnourished, and uh, then the survival uh, in one of the study was that they die almost like 45 percent of them. They die within like three months of starting dialysis. So it's it's a very frightening uh, situation, and uh, I'm sure everybody is aware of uh, the kidney disease, and it's a kind of an epidemic within our community. Uh, with uh, one of the uh, family member here and there may be affected. 
uh, within within our families. So, uh, looking at this, uh, what uh, since I've been in Pakistan since 2010, uh, I had been trying to make sure that we have the other uh, uh, the possibilities of making these patients' life much easier, more useful, making them more useful members of the society. And one of the, uh, the device that can help is the peritoneous dial dialysis cycler. So as uh, Eric was mentioning about the risk that is involved and you, you have to classify the, uh, uh, the machine according to the medical device, according to the risk. So uh, the uh, hemodialysis machine is, uh, is like a class three device, where if the, uh, uh, the line or the tubing is dislodged from the machine accidentally or whatever, and the pump is flowing so immediately 500 to 800 ml of blood can just uh, uh, can spill out and the patient may die within a few minutes if it is, if it is like uh, unattended. Uh, so it is, it is of a high risk device. Whereas a peritoneal dialysis device is a cycler that puts in fluid inside the abdomen and takes it out, supports so in and takes it out. So even if there is a is a damage or disconnection or whatever, it is not going to be immediately uh, detrimental or uh, for the uh, patient's life. It's kind of a class two device where we can put it. Um, in terms of um, uh, looking at uh, these uh, uh, devices, uh, I have been involved in uh, this uh, peritoneal dialysis cycler and. Uh, the most important thing is, is our patients. So that's what we are thinking about. So the device has to be, uh, to be of the standard where it is effective and it is safe. That's you know, the bottom line. Uh, the, there are multiple issues that come up, come up post marketing and uh, that can be evaluated, but there are minor things and that, uh, that needs experience. Uh, in Pakistan, there is there's a lot of need of medical devices, and uh, if we are if we are not going to uh, start working in, on it, so we are just going to be uh, a consumer market for these devices, and a lot of uh, of our uh, of our uh, budget is spent on this. Uh, the devices can be made over here. There there's a lot of talent in software engineers, the biomedical engineers. Uh, the uh, uh, the other uh, mechanicals and electrical, and they can team up together and you know bring up uh, the devices that are useful for our patients. And uh, uh, the, the, similarly, diabetes is very common, and uh, almost I think twenty to twenty five percent of our population, somebody has diabetes, and and this is one of the major cause for putting a patient on dialysis also. And they're wonderful devices for, uh, for, uh, for diabetes, like insulin pump, uh, continuous glucose monitoring devices, which we don't have. And uh, these are the preventive, uh, preventing, uh, preventable uh, aspects of the devices that, uh, uh, that keeps the patient away from dialysis and further going into, uh, into a whole population of patients where the end result is, you know, a death in many of the patients. So uh, while we are trying to provide uh, the uh, quality care for our patients, we need these devices that are being built within our community and, uh, uh, and brought into the market so that we can help our patients in the long term. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to share your experience back in Pakistan and in your own specialty. So we have a wonderful uh, mix of professional like the physician in the participants and a lot of technical people. And I'm so happy and delighted to see some of the students for the first time, some of the students from the university from the biomedical engineering side. So they have also participated. So let's have a look to the uh, question. Uh, because uh, somebody asked uh, a question that uh, 
that dialysis is categorized differently for peritoneal and hemodialysis. For one, the dialysate is a drug. For the other, it is a device. Am I correct? So that is the question to Eric. So how the FDA uh, treat these? Well, it, Dr. Naman just <clears throat> basically indicated this. Um, it, it's not the fluid, whether it's blood or whether it's dialysate, it's the risk of use of the device. And <clears throat> so Dr. Naman was right. A, a tube comes, breaks or comes off of a hemo uh, device. Well, that, that could be pumping out enormous amounts of blood out of the patient, which, which, which could kill somebody very, very frequently very quickly. In terms of a peritoneal dialysis machine, we're pumping basically sugar and salt solution into the peritoneum. Um, it's very difficult to hurt somebody that way. So the risk is substantially lower in an APD machine than it is a hemo machine. And that's why one is class two and one is class three. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Professor uh, Noor Mohammed Bhatt. How is the allowed level of risk measured? Are there numerical measuring units to allow the level of risk for a given device? As normally scientific instrument lists the accuracy limit. Well, certainly we have accuracies on our performance specifications, but in terms of uh, quantitative limits on risk, no, we don't. It's, it's much more subjective to that than that because every device is different. How it can fail is different. And although the end results can be the same, how we get there is, is different. So um, if, again, that uh, standard ISO 14971, that basically prescribes a process which I described in this presentation where you uh, subjectively uh, estimate the, the severity and the and the frequency of occurrence. Now those numbers can get better once we have field experience, but um, this is typically how it's done. Um, Eric, there is another question from Franklin. Can we say that more about verification and validation? I was taught that verification test to make sure your implementation matches the design and validation test, whether you designed the right device. Is that an accurate description? That is spot on accurate. It's exactly right. Uh, verification is making sure that uh, the, what we design uh, meets all the requirements that we set out to. And validation is demonstrating that it, it works as whatever it is. So it, it meets its intended use. So he was spot on in his assessment. Uh, now we have with us uh, Dr. Umar Hayat, he is from the uh, West Coast, so he is quite a lead person in pharmaceutical development. So I would like Dr. Umar Hayat, you know, just to share his experience because he's a frequent traveler to home country back in Pakistan and looking particularly the new role of combination. Uh, so you know, thank you. Physical... Thank you very much. Yeah, please go ahead, Umar. My apologies. I was... Yes, Umar, go ahead, please. Dr. Umar, yeah. So my apologies, I was listening to the, are you there? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Yes, you can hear. So my apologies, I was listening to the talk, Eric. It was a wonderful talk. And at the same time, I was doing the gardening. <laughs> so no, that has been, uh, you know, Development of drugs is the one thing where my expertise are, and then devices, and especially nowadays with the combination drugs. I think your um, your presentation was very, very valuable. So I really like the way you have uh, expressed the FMEA and then uh, categorized them based on the uh, PRN, like the probability and uh, what's the frequency and what kind of controls you can put in place. And that's the area I think as a, uh, uh, not only Pakistan as a country, uh, 
but even from the regulatory bodies, that's the area we are lacking a lot of uh, experience and expertise. So I think this presentation uh, certainly uh, will trigger a lot of uh, thinking. And uh, from regulatory point of view, the, uh, also the interest in the putting together the regulations. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I always say, where would be the next cheap heaven uh, for the pharma or device industry? And I totally agree, Pakistan would be the one where they are highly qualified people. And we have a population more than 220 million. So yeah, so you were right spot on that one as well. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I don't have any comment or, uh, I mean, I don't have any question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Umar. And, uh, you know, we are uh, dot on time and I know this is the Ramazan. The last few days we have some of the energy, particularly because it's a daytime here in North America and it is nighttime. Uh, I think you will be preparing for Eid back in Pakistan. So uh, an advanced Eid Mubarak to all of you. Enjoy your Eid very soon. And here the people, they are still fasting. So because it's a daytime and uh, we are moving towards the closing. Uh, in the meanwhile, if there are any question uh, in the chat box, we will try to respond to it individually and because of the time limitation. And I'm really grateful and uh, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot to Eric, Dr. Norman, Umar Hayat, and you know, all the participant and the team, which is uh, the technical team behind all this to make it happen. But uh, I have also, mentioned the link to the YouTube channel where you can find all the material, all the previous recording. There is a live uh, webcast, which is going on the Facebook as well. If you had like to review any of the ses session or any of your interest area, you are more than welcome. So it was a wonderful mix of a lot of people from North America, the professional, the clinician, <laughs> and the user and a uh, lot of people, a lot of interest from uh, Pakistan. So once again, I formally thanked all of you and particularly the uh, Dr. Noman for sharing uh, his thought and his commitment and motivation to go back and really to start and make a difference. And Eric, you know, moving from Florida and enjoying the Ramadan back in Pakistan. So all the best and an advanced Eid Mubarak to all of you. And thank you very much. And uh, see you soon next in the next session because we are going to have two sessions, maybe the May 7th and 14th. And we have a wonderful thing to discuss about the um, health and the science diplomacy by some of the foreign office people and a professor from Sikkir, Dr. Zulfkar Bhutta. So that is the schedule for the coming two webinar. We'll be sharing with you all the information. So thank you very much and all the best to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eid Mubarak, everybody. Eid Mubarak. Eid Mubarak.